Welcome to a live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, STS Nation? And K9 Catherine is on the money. Uh-oh. Uh, better get Mako. Uh, trouble in paradise. Uh all of our guests, we have four lined up. Uh, none are in here, and I didn't want to keep you guys waiting, so I told the COE I will be brave, and I will jump on. I will hop on, and I will talk true crime until our first guest gets here. Uh, obviously, this is Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that brings you the very best guests in all of true crime, and today, hopefully, will be no exception. Also, for full disclosure, the COE and I were in here with help from Space Coast on the West Coast. And uh, the Fisher Price set appears to be working for the time being. Ha I have no idea. Um, the COE, the notorious COE and Space Coast wiggled some wires, talked to each other, talked about USB-C things, and uh, everything appears to be working. But at any moment, if I hear a loud screeching sound, I will know I am right at home at Global Headquarters. Um, but we are talking and we are um, always revamping and we will get this uh, all um, improved, new and improved uh, over the next few months. We're going to get a new computer in here and some new wiring and uh, hardwire everything. So uh, we are the legit podcast that we are. Uh, we put the cart ahead of the horse, I guess. But today, of course, uh, jury selection uh, for Chad Daybell ended so that is not what happened but we had opening uh statements from both the state and the defense jury selection of course uh wrapped up earlier uh in the week and today was a chance for the state and the defense to lay out their case which is exactly what they did and then they called their first witness so for full disclosure again lauren matthias from uh hidden true crime a fantastic podcast just look at this teach show how to use the world the word World Wide Web, www. Yes, we go. Uh, Fisher Price is going to sue me. Uh, that's okay. Come at me. Sponsor us, Fisher Price. Sponsor us. I mentioned your name a lot. So, Lauren Mathias, uh, of course, one half of Hidden True Crime. She was going to join us, but uh, then her schedule got screwy because the bigger fish were asking her to come on. Uh, we'll get her back on. Greg Scordis. Uh, he is an attorney out of Salt Lake City, a fantastic attorney, and he was on Mountain Daylight Time, thinking this was going to start two hours from now, so he is scurrying to a cell phone. And then we've got Megan Connor. Of course, she is Lori Vallow's cousin. Uh, she's supposed to be coming on and is MIA at the moment, so that leaves yours truly here. And then uh, Gigi McKelvey, uh, she said as soon as she wraps her podcast, she was going to come on. So now is a beautiful time for you guys to ask me any questions that you may have about today's proceedings and or anything else uh, on your mind. But uh, if you were here earlier today, Tim Jansen and I, um, we covered opening statements. And I have to say that Rob Wood, the Madison County prosecuting attorney who delivered opening statements for the state of Idaho, he was um, lackluster at best. I think he disappointed a lot of people. Uh, almost everyone who was in the chat this morning was like, that's all you got. Uh, this is the biggest, highest profile uh, case in the United States of America right now. And uh, he basically came um, with a script in hand, which is never a good thing. If you ever see a lawyer with a script in their hand, that's not good. Uh, the COE and I went to see a stand-up comic, a very well-known one. I'm not going to mention his name. A couple of weeks ago, and he had a music stand with notes, and that irritated the crap out of me because uh, the tickets were really expensive. So, uh, when you're a performer and when you are on stage, and that is what uh, an attorney is when he is in front of a courtroom as a trial attorney, uh, he should not have had a script, but uh, he did. And let's go over some of these opening statements and uh, what Rob Wood had to say, and I am seeing some questions floating through here. Uh, did this the most important question of the day from Tennis Girl, did the COE win her match this morning? I have no idea, but I do know that 
once again, our taxes are due and I'm working on some other stuff and um, I'm going to have to pull the COE off the tennis court and uh, have her deal with some uh, other resources. Uh, she won five, one. There you go. Uh, there's your answer. Um, I think I can officially say this. The New York city book signing is now set. Uh, I don't think we have a graphic for this, but we will be Carmen. I in New York city on May 19th. That is a Sunday, May 19th, a Sunday. And we will be at the Jewish heritage museum. That is for the launch of the book, uh, Lauren from hidden true crime. Chad didn't wait a single day to throw Lori out of the bus by saying she has a past and that Lori has a sexual divorcee with failed marriages, uh, who seduced him. And we will get into that in a moment, but, um, we will be in New York on May 19th, uh, around 12 30 PM. I'll put out something official and, uh, the guest of honor there will actually be a very well-known, uh, national network news correspondent that you have likely seen on 48 hours. So I'll let you figure that one out. And then I will make an official announcement. Uh, he is from the same hometown as myself and he's been at CBS news for more than 30 years, I think. And, uh, He's going to moderate our discussion. So if you're in the metropolitan area, uh, please come out and say hello. So, yeah, it was heavy this morning. And uh, COE, if you can check in with uh, Megan Connor, I'm going to send you her uh, her number right now, and then we will get uh, cracking on this um, in just a moment. It's kind of fun doing a show with no guests. Never done this before because we're the best guests in true crime. Uh, maybe next week we'll be – no guest in true crime. If you guys know Tim Dillon, uh, the comic, uh, he basically just gets on and rants for an hour and a half solo. Um, maybe I could do that. Uh, I could just rant about true crime. These, of course, are the victims. You've got J.J. Vallow, Tylee Ryan, Tammy Daybell, uh, the ones who really uh, paid the price for this. So getting back to uh, opening statements, let me take a breath here. Um Again, this was Rob Wood, the prosecuting attorney for Madison County out east in Idaho. And his first three words were at 9.39 a.m. local time. And the three words were two dead children. Those were the first three words uttered out of his mouth. Two dead children found buried in Chad Daybell's backyard. So that is how he began this. Uh, and then he goes on to say that 17 days later... Uh, he married his mistress on the beaches of, of Hawaii after Tammy Day Daybell was found dead uh, in her bed. 17 days after that, he's on a beach uh, with Lori Vallow uh, in Hawaii. So um, that seems to strike me as some form um, of consciousness of guilt um, just taken off on a dead wife, uh, doesn't, doesn't smell, feel, or look right. Um, so he's going to have an uphill battle here. Um, and I'm seeing a question from IGG rocks as a man, Joel, did Pryor's opening statement come across as sexist to you? I didn't see that. I actually thought that he was better off and here is Megan Connor. How are you, Megan? I'm good. How are you? Excellent. Um, I know uh, people get confused with times. Uh, I'm glad you are here because you are our only guest right now. <laughs> <laughs> I had some technical difficulties and had to reboot my computer, so I apologize for being so late. <laughs> no, no problem at all. It's good to have someone to talk to. I thought I was going to have to talk to myself and uh, <laughs> do a monologue. Um, but again, you know, we've had you on in recent weeks, and this is so different for you than I think it is for everyone else because you are a family member. You are Lori Vallow's cousin. We've had obviously Lori's brother, Adam on the show, as you know, and, uh, uncle Rex. But, um, today, um, the state started and I was just saying this with the three words, two dead children found buried in Chad Daybell's backyard. That was the opening of his opening statement. Um, a lot of people thought he was very lackluster. What, what did you make of it? Yeah, I, well, um, the, the prosecutor, I, I thought he did a decent job of um, of laying a laying out the case. It's so complicated. And I appreciated that he broke it down for the jury into chapters. And I appreciated that um, that he was able to make a concise timeline for for the jurors. 
I thought that part of it was was good. I did think that it lacked perhaps a little bit of punch, but um, overall, I thought he did a decent job. Greg Scordis, thank you for coming on. Apologies about the uh, confusion with uh, Eastern Daylight Time versus Mountain Time. Uh, didn't mean to screw that one up. But uh, from what I understand, you were in the courtroom. Is that right? Yeah, I've been in there all day. I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I love you. You know I love this show. I thought it was 7 o'clock Mountain Time. I'm an idiot. But yeah, I was in the courtroom from before the before the bell rung this morning. Yeah, and, and I'm curious, if you are you out there just because of your own interest, or is there another reason that you're out there right now? I'm covering up for a local uh, TV affiliate in Salt Lake City, and they've asked me. I, I covered Lori's as well, as you recall, a year ago we were on your show. Um, and I've just been following the case, so I've been doing some uh, live commentary for the local uh, CBS affiliate, or ABC, well, NBC affiliate. Yeah, well, uh, you got to get those letters right, Greg. Yeah, right? seriously, right. <laughs> um, so, Rob Wood, um, you know, we I covered it this morning with Tim Jansen, a criminal defense attorney. Uh, Tim himself is very animated when he's in the courtroom. And Rob Wood, um, very lackluster to me. I'm just curious what the feeling was. Is A lot of times it's different within the courtroom. He didn't seem to bring a lot of energy, and he was clutching those notes, which drove me crazy. Um, but what did you guys make of it inside the courtroom? Kind of the same thing, Joel. It was disappointing, especially because his co-counsel, uh, who did the opening in Lori's case, was much more animated. I thought she was uh, just just a little bit better uh, in terms of her presentation. I, and, and it was disappointing. You know, and, and things that happened during the opening that were just um, a problem. Uh, one is that... Um, you know, his, his mic didn't work at one point, his PowerPoint didn't work. And you know, Joel, when you're doing a preparation, when you're doing a show, when you're doing an opening statement, if any kind of presentation, when your audio visual doesn't work, especially day one, minute one, uh, it, it kind of puts you off. And, and that he, I don't know that he ever recovered from that. Uh, I have to agree with you, but um, people who live in glass houses cannot throw stones. Uh, we've had audio wrecks on this show, but again, I'm not... Um... I know. I'm not the prosecuting attorney in the most high, high profile case. And uh, I got to tell you that the courtroom feed is pretty horrendous, too. It's a very wide angle. It's hard to see. The audio is kind of crappy. But uh, Judge Boyce wanted it this way. Uh, he controls the courtroom. And uh, that's what we have here. Uh, I'm going to get back to Greg in a minute. Um, but Megan, it was, was there anything in particular that just jumped out at you today um, from kind of a macro perspective? Um, you know, the, uh, the, I find the audio very difficult to listen to on this one, as opposed to Lori's trial. I felt like it was pretty clear. It sounds a little garbled to me from where I am. And maybe that's it, you know, it could just be my equipment or something like that, but I, I found it difficult to listen to. Um, I listened to Lori's trial, uh, every day on two X speed because it helped me sort of, get the information I needed without feeling so heavy about everything. And I couldn't do that with Chad's trial today um, because the audio was kind of bad. So in light of that, I, I have a question to ask. Am I, was I just hearing things or at the end of John Pryor's opening argument, did he ask the jury to return a verdict of guilty? It's funny that you say, you're saying at the end of John Pryor, is that right? Yes, yes. I, I think, uh, Greg, do you care to comment on that? Because I think <laughs> I think he may have screwed up and said that. Um, yeah, I have not I, gone I, back and listened to it, but Greg? Yeah, I was there. I don't recall that. Maybe because I'm a defense attorney and I just assume we all end with and find our client not guilty. And so I just uh, sort of tuned him out at that point. Uh, I wasn't uh, overwhelmed by his opening remarks either. But I, I don't believe he said that. Um, if so, I'm not sure the jury would have picked up on it any more than anyone else. But that would have certainly been a faux pas. Unless maybe he's, it uh, was. Yeah, maybe, uh, Megan. Yeah. I was just going to say, unless he's really annoyed because he's not really getting paid anything for this. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I right. think that would be ineffective uh, assistance of counsel. So yeah. um, I think right. we'd have issues. Um, 
I'm sorry, Megan. Did you want to add something else? I didn't mean to. No, I was just going to say it's possible that it was just an audio glitch that it came through that way because it did seem like the audio maybe sped up just a little bit at that point. But I, I had to go back and rewind it several times because I swear he said return a verdict of guilty. But mm. uh, I'll go back and rewatch it. Gigi McKelvey is <laughs> all over this kind of stuff. Uh, what's up, Rockstar G Money? Um, what's up, Joel? You know, people ask me, do you have a new nickname? And I'm like, nope, Joel gave me that nickname. Yeah. <laughs> G Money, we lost Greg. This is quite a show. We started with no guests. We had <laughs> two guests, three guests. Now we're back to two. Hey, Greg. Uh, Greg, you're going to make me nervous. So if you hold that phone up, your arm is going to is going to as strong a man and as in shape as you are, it's going to kill you. So try to prop it on something. But Carrie Lasseter here says they are supposed to sound convincing. Gigi, we were talking about this right before you got on. Rob Wood holding notes in his hand and uh, sounding like a uh, like a church mouse. You could barely hear the guy squeak. Um, what do you make of that? Look, I think it was effective. I, I love the chapter system. I mean, it, look, this is a convoluted case. You can't throw everything at these jurors right out of the gate. I think the way he did it was really good. And he kind of did the same last year. It was different openings. The way he did, of course, is very specific to Chad, but I thought it was good. You don't always have to like yell and spit on the jurors right out of the gate. Um, so I think that gentle approach, because it's a very heavy subject with these kids. And I think keeping your voice low and calm, it kind of sets the tone of this may be scandalous with the text messages and the storm and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's about these kids that were found on his property dead and Tammy Daybell. So I, for me personally, I liked it. I mean, I thought it was appropriate and short, which is good because we could be here till the second coming. If he tried to explain the whole story right out of the gate. That's a good point. It's 22 minutes. And I was telling Tim Jansen, by the way, 1010 wins in New York City. Their motto is you give us 22 minutes and we'll give you the world. Well, uh, Rob Wood gave him 22 minutes and he gave him the Lori Vallow story, which is basically the equivalent of telling that story, uh, the, the entire story of the world, because it's so convoluted. Um, Sandra pointing out that we do have, in fact, an international audience. And then Little Lamb, uh, I feel like I'm just used to bad court audio tech at this point. I just want to make it abundantly clear that even though uh, we seem to have Fisher Price equipment here and we have audio problems. That is the courtroom feed. We have nothing to do with what you're hearing on that courtroom feed. Uh, Space Coast on the West Coast is, uh, of course, always trying to sweeten the audio. Uh, this question, obviously, for Lori's cousin, Megan Connor, uh, again from Carrie. What are Megan's impressions of the testimony so far? Obviously, day one, we had Ray Hermosillo, the detective on there. Um, but what what do you just make of the general feeling uh today versus the last go around well there certainly are uh, many more objections from the defense team in this case than there were in Lori's case and i think that's probably because um chad is actually allowing his attorney to put on a defense here um I think he's he's doing a decent job of trying to get objections in where he can. But I do find that to be a little bit tedious, especially when we're talking about crime scene photos that have, you know, pretty obviously been taken by professional people and things like that. So that part I had a hard time with. Um, and there definitely was a portion of Detective Hermosillo's uh, testimony that was pretty much the same um, as in Lori's case the day they they found the children um i was just recalling that 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 was almost almost word for word the same description that he gave of chad looking over his shoulder and and all of that so that man that took me right back to last year and that was really hard for me it was um i started to feel i you know to be honest with you i i didn't think that this trial was going to be as hard for me um because it's chad and not my own cousin but you know, it's still, you know, the deaths of, of um, you know, innocent people, two of whom I was related to. And as soon as um, Rob Wood said two dead children, that it was like, OK, I can't. I, <laughs> this is going to be just as emotional for me as the last trial was, too. So um, I'm preparing for some self-care. Uh, that's a good thing, a sad thing, but uh, I'm glad that you're being realistic about it. And I think it's going to be difficult for everyone, but obviously 
especially for the families. You know, yesterday we covered the sentencing for uh, James and Jennifer Crumbly and just hearing the victim impact statements yesterday, especially from one of the victims, a uh, very young older sister. It was, it broke my heart. Um, so these are real people with real repercussions um, and real tragedy that they are dealing with. Uh, Greg scored is so, as Megan has alluded to, and and Gigi so far, Rob Wood broke this into chapters, which that part I thought was interesting because, of course, Chad Daybell was writing these kind of whacked out books. Um, and I think there was some, um, you know, overlap with that, uh, some allusion to that. And uh, he went on to say that he craved significance. Uh, that's what he wanted in his life and talks about how Chad had five children and uh, eventually moved to Idaho, where he married this beloved school librarian. And uh, the quote was, for this defendant, that ordinary existence was not enough. Um, as he's building up to the fact that he then gets mired in this relationship with Lori Vallow. With Lori Vallow. But I'm just curious um, if you've ever used that approach, this chapter approach to telling a story. And in some ways it was effective. Um, you know, there's no way you're going to be able to lay out all the evidence in a case of this magnitude. So it was, it was short, simple and to the point, but maybe too simple. But, uh, again, I digress there. Your thoughts on this chapter, breaking it into chapters notion. You know, I haven't used that approach, Joel. And, and after watching it today, I probably won't. And I don't mean to be uh, <laughs> condescending at all. It just, I didn't think it was effective. I mean, it was effective in that it played with his PowerPoint and he was able to do the chapter. And, and I think that he was almost letting the PowerPoint lead his, his opening because he would look at what the next slide was and then he could talk about it. Um, but, you know, he covered the bases. I, I, I he, he did what he needed to do. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't gangbusters, but you, you really don't want to be in opening remarks. You really don't need to, especially if you're the prosecution, you need to be, you need to, you're, you're there for the state, you're there for the people, you're there for the victims, uh, you're just doing your job, and you want the jury to, to, to find for the truth. And so maybe the impassioned part of me when I was a prosecutor was maybe it's not as effective. Do we just lose Greg's audio, or is that me? Yeah, I cut out there at the end. Yeah, it did. Yeah, I thought so. It's okay. Well, Greg will reestablish with that uh wi-fi signal which i think is yeah, it's just, it's just, yeah it's just great different than what i would have done Joel. i'm uh, sorry no no worries no worries you cut out a little bit there um Gigi, the question for you here uh do you wish that you were at the trial i know you said you're obviously not going to be that this is a two month two and a half month trial so uh Gigi last time said she was going to be uh going out here and there but what, what's it like to have not uh been there today for these opening uh statements yeah it felt a little weird but you know i've i have a grip my grandmother's 89 i helped take care of her her back's hurting so i went and took care of her so it was nice because i'd have just been worried it's streaming so at least we have that but i'm looking maybe to go next week or the week after my oldest is graduating my youngest is running varsity track so it's like i have all these mom things which come first so thank goodness for the streaming as bad as the audio and video is. Uh, but yeah, I'll be up there periodically for sure. Um, like she was like, uh, um, is it, it's Megan, right? Yes. Megan, I girl. love that pronunciation. That's, that's yeah. So unique. But like she was saying, I literally pulled out my notes from detective Hermosillo's testimony from last year when I couldn't hear today. And it was almost word for word. You know, he knows this case, like the back of his hand, he's been on it since the day everybody was aware the kids were missing even before um, so I think a lot of the same with the state's witnesses, but I actually may save my air miles for when the defense puts on a case for when his kids testify. That's going to be really, I think, where we're going to see some fireworks. Yeah, uh, that's going to be wild. Uh, he's bringing out this DNA expert. I'll get into that, uh, who helped Amanda Knox get off in Italy. Uh, so there's some powerful people. And then Zulema is uh, going to be a witness as well, from what we understand. And that, of course, is Alex Cox's uh, wife, uh, one-time wife. Um, Megan, this question to you from Annie Kay. Do you buy the idea of Lori Vallow Daybell being the controlling person in uh, the couple? 
Yeah. So, I mean, this is the whole reason that I even started speaking out when I did last year, um, just prior to the trial, because I kept hearing this narrative in the media that Lori was a great mom and she was, um, you know, so kind and sweet and loving. And I was like, that's not the Lori that I knew. That's not the Lori that I grew up with. I think she definitely was manipulative and I think she definitely was controlling. However, the theology came from Chad. Um, Lori did buy into it, but it came from Chad. Light and dark came from Chad. Zombies came from Chad. The kids were in Chad's backyard. So to put all of the onus on Lori and say that it was all her and, you know, Chad was just, you know, starstruck or love struck or whatever. I, that, that actually made me angry listening to that today um, to hear, you know, to hear them take that tack and, and try to put it all on, on Lori. Um, I'm hopeful that they're, that we're going to hear some new evidence in this trial that is going to, um, let us know a little bit more about Chad's role and his involvement. And, and also I'm really interested to hear about um, more about Alex's involvement as well. Cause that's been a big question mark for me too. And uh, I follow Gigi closely on the Twitter and uh, she tweeted out a meme that it didn't take long for uh, prior to throw Lori right under the bus. Uh, and that is true. And someone was asking, are we going to talk about the defense uh, yes, we are. I'm going to go through this sort of methodically uh, from the state's opening statements and then to the defense opening statements. Uh, this is kind of an interesting point, actually, Greg, back to you on this one uh, from Judy Nickens. And I love all these new names in the chat. Welcome to everybody. I was wondering why the state did not bring up Chad being a professional grave digger. I think that will come up at some point. Uh, he had some opportunities to bring it up today. Uh, did you make anything of that, Greg? No, I, I thought that would have been more of a more of a I don't know cheap shot. I don't know I don't know how it's relevant. I don't know how it plays in. It wasn't part of the state's case. Yeah, I guess you could bring it up at some point and sort of sort of point out the irony of that. But that wasn't part of what the state was trying to do. It had nothing to do with their the nine chapters that they went through today, and um, really really not much to do with the case. I mean, he he went through what the evidence is and what they're going to do and talked about chad's sort of like you said very very well uh, life as a father of five married to a librarian to you know falling in love with this great seductress who sort of took him in places he'd never been before but ultimately he was the one that was calling the shots and he was the one that was doing the things and and um i think they want to point him out as a or, or at least have the jury believe that he was not just being followed by his by his lust, that he saw something here, saw an opportunity here. And he was the one that was espousing this dark, light personality thing. And, and I think Lori saw that as an opportunity for her as well. So I don't know that either one of them was driving the ship. It was just a perfect storm of two people that should have never met in the first place. Uh, Greg, probably the most important question back to you it's a jury made up of 10 men and eight women. We don't know who the alternates are, uh, 12 regular jurors, six alternates. Uh, how did they seem to you? Uh, what was their reaction when the state delivered opening statements? How about the defense? Uh, did they look engaged? I think so. I mean, I was literally sitting very, very close to the jury. They, they were in my line of sight, uh, the two rows. And I thought that they were, I mean, the judge had given them uh, the ability to write down things. A lot of them were taking notes. A lot of them were writing things down. I was watching the things that they were writing down. Um, so, yeah, they seemed very engaged. And you would expect that on day one, Joel. I mean, this we'll see how they're reacting, you know, in May, maybe in June if this case goes that far. But, yeah, they want to see what this case is about, and they were tuned in. And right from the opening get-go, and even the detective, uh, Hermosillo, who testified, and he was the only witness that testified. And I don't think we're even halfway through his testimony. They were following him closely. They were writing things down. I think they were expressing some level of annoyance with the constant objections from defense counsel that were not effective. Um, and I hope that that's not the way this trial is going to go for defense, because that's going to bother the jury at some point. And they did not seem very uh, impressed with that. Uh, we saw that in the Michelle Traconis case with John Schoenhorn, 
who's a fine criminal defense attorney. We'll come back to Greg and ask him a little more about those objections. Uh, G Money McKelvey, can you just um, inform the audience? This keeps coming up over and over. I thought the defense was out of money. How do they pay for these high priced experts? It's literally one attorney, John Pryor, and he tried to wiggle his way out and Judge Boyce didn't allow him to do that. Uh, we joke, but it's true that I think he own literally owns Chad Daybell's house now. But um, Tim Jansen was in disbelief. He, he said that a trial like this should be a million dollar payday for a criminal defense attorney. He doesn't even know if Chad's getting uh, I'm sorry, if John's getting a couple of hundred grand, if that. Uh, so what, what's the bottom line here? What do we know about payments here for John Pryor and why he is doing this uh, for very little pay, relatively speaking? Well, when they had the hearing where he asked to be removed, which was weird because in the middle of the hearing, he's like, I don't want to be removed. So I was like, well, why are we here? But actually, he um, some of the experts are paid for by by public, you know, taxpayer money. But you only get so many. So it's not like it's a free for all where you can bring in 20 expert witnesses. But I think, you know, three or four probably are paid for by tax dollars. John Pryor said at that hearing he was essentially doing this for free at this point. But it's a little late in the game. I mean, he's been on this case since pretty much day one, the very beginning. He should have known a couple of years ago. He wasn't going to be able to handle a 10-week trial that's a death case, which he's never tried, uh, on his own. What happens is that if this dude gets like COVID or something or has an appendix attack? <laughs> this trial's going to get delayed. There's nobody there for like backup. It's crazy. But no, he owns the deed to the house. Good luck selling it because I, I just don't. I mean, some of Chad's kids are still living in that house right now, but I don't know how he's ever going to think that he's going to get repaid with that land. Maybe somebody will get it and say, hey, I can live here, but not me. I'll tell you, I would not want to live in that house. I mean, in a it's, lot of states. I'm mm -hmm. almost it's so there. heavy there. I, oh. I went last year, but the day before her sentencing, and it's just, you know, you just feel the weight. It's it's almost physical to think yeah. you're, you're looking at the, these two spots in the house where three people were just collateral damage in this wackadoodle plan. Yeah, you know, it's insane. And I'm sorry, Mika, I was just going to say very quickly that in a lot of states, I'm almost sure in Jersey and I think in Florida, you have to, if you're selling a home where there was a death or a murder, you have to uh, let the buyer know that. Uh, I don't know if that's the case in Idaho, but go ahead, Megan. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to, I was just going to say, I'll put this out, out there. Um, you know, if John Pryor wants to put it on the market, if I could afford to buy it, I would buy it 100%. I would have that house raised, and I would put up in a permanent memorial to the children. Spot on. Um, mic drop moment right there. Uh, John Pryor, surviving the survivor at Gmail. Contact me. You have a buyer for the house, and uh, maybe we can raise the money and uh, raise the house, R-A-Z-E, and then uh, and then we could put up a memorial. That's actually a really cool idea. Um Hopefully there's someone out there listening uh, who's a financial backer for this plan. Uh, meanwhile, Lindsay Shea says three best guests. That's why we have the best guests in all of true crime. Uh, Gigi, someone wanted to know when will, because uh, you said you want to go out there for Chad Daybell's kids, who are all adults, by the way. He has five children. When do you think they would testify if you had to take a guess? It's going to be later on after the the state rests and the defense takes over. I, I fully expect them. They're going to be defense witnesses. Although for me, I kind of wonder about Garth Daybell because he was there when Chad found Tammy dead and there was, he was actually the first one on that 911 call. So for me, could he be a state's witness? And then you've got a few, I think he said what, three or four, he said two or three, three or four. Um, so I, I'm curious about Garth. But I do think that that'll, that'll come in the defense because he said they're going to testify that she was sick, wasn't going to the doctor, was doing homeopathic stuff, which um, kind of blew my mind, to be honest. Um, Megan, back to you on this. And I think this was the part that, and of course, my computer just flipped out. But um, after, after the technical issues, Rob Wood goes... And I quote here, you'll hear about a pivotal date, the day Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow met at a religious conference in St. George, Utah. That introduction set into motion what you will hear about. And then he goes on in his thirst for sex, power, money. Chad created this alternate reality where he called themselves James and Elena. 
more than anything else, Chad's obsession with Lori was rooted in her adoration for him. He called her an exalted goddess. They're really like playing up the sexualization of Lori Vallow. Um, just curious what you make of that, that she literally seduced him into doing this. Yeah, I, um, I, it's hard for me to, to listen to that. Um, it's hard for me to wrap my brand, um, wrap my brain around my feelings, um, right now. So just forgive me if I'm not as articulate as, as I like to be, but, um, they, yeah, he called her Miss Texas, right. Which she didn't win that pageant by the way. So, um, you know, there's definitely some over-exaggeration and reaching there to try and, you know, make her into some kind of a, a succubus. But, uh, you know, I, Obviously, while I think there's manipulation, the manipulation that, that went on there and everything like that, um, I think it was Lori's intent to, to meet Chad because she was drawn to his near-death experience power. Um, and I think that it was beneficial to Chad, obviously, to have a beautiful woman um, interested in him in any way. And so I just think that, um, you know using Lori's looks and the sexuality to try and excuse murder is kind of just disgusting to me. I don't know what else to say about it right now. Uh, th those words are well said. No apology necessary. This is heavy, uh, heavy stuff. I'm going to bring this comment in just to lighten things up for one moment. Oh th yeah, this is it from Black Widow in the Republic of Ireland. She says, I need a puppy bath. I have no idea. Sometimes she says things with Irish references. I have no idea if that's what this is or what she's talking about. But I digress for one minute to let you know that today after opening statements, I let both Ethel and Frederick Morris Roosevelt Brown out in the back to let their legs loose. And uh, Fred was chasing Ethel and lo and behold, Fred flipped over backwards and fell in the pool upside down. I could not believe my eyes. He floated to the top and he was able to paddle his way out into the shallow end. So I bring that up for one reason. I now know that Fred Brown can handle his own at four months old in a swimming pool. Um, I digress. <laughs> Greg Scordis, back to you. Um, Got to have some levity uh, when we're dealing with really heavy stuff. I'm curious, uh, probably the least um, impressive human being to me on Earth, the person who would leave the least impression on me, on planet earth might be Chad Daybell. I said he would have a major career as a commercial actor because the guy could be a milkman. He could be an insurance man. He could be a goat herder. He could be anything. He's just the most bland, boring looking human I've ever seen. Curious Greg Scordis, now that I've eviscerated him because he can't come yell at me. Um, what did you make of him in court? Did he have any emotion? People say he literally does not move. Um, was he reacting to anything? You know, I'll tell you one of the weirdest things I've seen in a while, Joel. When we walked in the courtroom today uh, and the lawyers were not there and the judge was not there, Chad was there. And his table was facing crossways so we could see him. It wasn't, we did, it wasn't like his back was to us. And he just stood there staring at the wall in front of him. And he didn't move for 20 minutes. It was weird. And I, I felt sorry for him a little bit because I thought, dude, you need some friends or you need somebody to talk to. I mean, he was just there alone. I don't know why they brought him out like that. I don't know why his attorney allowed that to occur. The jury wasn't there yet. But he just sat there stoic. And he did. He looked just the way you just described as this guy who's like, why am I here? What's going on? You know, he did not look like a criminal defendant in a three count three first degree murder count facing the death penalty and even during the trial no reaction not much at all just kind of sitting there he and his attorney had no interaction hardly at all and um i, I it, it's the way you've described him i think you, you nailed it joe it's just he's kind of just the this milk toast guy who was writing books and i guess Lori saw some you know this preacher man that could maybe help her with her goals it's it's really odd to me because, um, you know, whatever you're going to say about Lori Valla, at one point she was an attractive woman. I know a lot of people don't feel that way. And she seemed to have 
charisma. When you talk to Megan, like, you know, there were friends uh, growing up and she, but he just seems so unbelievably just detached and monotone. Gigi, let's drill down on this for a minute. I mean, what's going on here with him? Uh, how did he, how did he get himself where he is right now? That's, that's the part I cannot wrap my head around. How did he, I can see someone with a personality like Lori, who's, she's got personality, but Chad seems to literally have none. So how did he literally end up in the most high profile case, as Greg just said, as a three count criminal defendant, when he looks like he should be delivering your newspaper? Gigi. Ooh. I was unmuted because my dog was barking. Oh. Um, I, 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 yeah. Um, so I think, you know, hearing pe from people like April Raymond from Hawaii that knew her when they lived on the island, she made comments to April that Charles was not her spiritual equal. She was going to temple for hours a day. She was reading these books, listening to these podcasts. So I don't think it was necessarily Chad. It was Lori was seeking something higher in a spiritual sense. And I think she was obsessed with his book. She was trying to give them to her friends to read, to get people on board. And when she met him, it's kind of like, you know, one of us meeting our favorite celebrity. And then that favorite celebrity flirts with you a little bit. And then there you go. So I think it was a, a bigger thing for Lori. I think it was that validation where Chad made her feel and convinced her. I don't want to say convinced her. I think she probably believed it pretty easily that she's an exalted goddess. Because I think in the back of her mind, she probably thought she was better than everybody else in a spiritual sense. And so fire gasoline. I don't think there was one that was more at fault or less at fault than the other. I think it was they took turns being in charge. And Gigi, you you literally know this case probably as well as anyone, including family, um, <laughs> because you've, you've studied this and done over 50 podcasts. There's an argument, not an argument, but a discussion, I should say, in the chat about whether or not Chad is on the spectrum, uh, the autism spectrum. What is your research found? I mean, I've always thought, and I apologize if he is, I've never heard that. Um, I just thought he's kind of dopey. Has there ever been any medical proof that he's on the spectrum as far as you know? You know, I've actually never heard anybody talk about that. Um, I think we're all on the spectrum in a weird way. I think we all have tendencies, but I think Chad just for me seems like that socially awkward person that you might say hi to, but you're not going to have this really in-depth conversation with, you know, unless you're like-minded. It seems like Chad just surrounded himself with people who thought he was James the Just and the brother of Jesus in a past life. You know, you pick the people you hang out with because, you know, like Lori, they built her up. They told her what she wanted to hear. Chad told her, and I think it went the same way for Chad. I think he liked having that little group that he felt he had this big influence over, and especially Lori, because here we are. Uh, she Jukester is getting upset. All these ignorant people in the chat calling an autistic person a slug and other bad names. Uh, she Jukester, I'm curious if you have uh, proof that he is on the autism spectrum and you can email me surviving the survivor at gmail.com. I'd be very interested to uh, read about that. But as far as I know, that he's never been diagnosed as such. So I don't know if it's an overreaction on your part or inaccuracy and lack of knowledge on my part. But uh, again, I'm open-minded. I'd be curious to hear um, what you know about that. If uh, there's anything else to be gleaned from it. Um, meanwhile, Megan, back to you. Um, Rob Wood went on. He said, anyone who opposed Chad and Lori, and again, he was going through this pretty methodically uh, chapter by chapter as he was uh, laying it out in his own way. He said that Lord, Chad and Lori were labeled uh, labeling people dark spirits or zombies, which we all know. And he says that Alex Cox, of course, Lori's brother, told his wife Zulema that he'd be the fall guy and then goes on to say that Charles Vallow was shot and killed by Alex because Lori stood to get a million dollars only for her to learn that she was no longer the beneficiary. Um, we talked about this very dysfunctional relationship and that is a kind way of putting it but just reflecting it on it some more and hearing this stuff today about alex telling zulema that he thought he'd be the fall guy what what do you think happened in this dynamic between alex and Lori, and how did it evolve do you think over time well i think we 
have seen a lot of clear evidence that Lori was for Lori, period. And she wanted what she wanted, and then she knew how to manipulate people in order to get it. And Chad's um, theology gave her a good vehicle for, I think, you know, firstly, getting getting rid of Charles, um, justifying that with religious beliefs, and then, you know, continuing to take it and escalate it and eliminate all, as he said, all of the obstacles that were in the way of Lori getting what she wanted. And so my uh, sort of theory about all of that is that Alex was useful. Um, he was a useful servant. He did anything that Lori asked him to do, and she knew that he would. And so um, when they were finished with him and he had played his role, um, I really think that they either somehow killed him or or that he or convinced him that it was okay for him to kill himself because um he was done with his mission and i think that was what that blessing from chad was about and i think that was probably part of Lori's narrative all along was like well let let me get this person to do what i want and then she discarded him just like she discarded charles just like she discarded the children just like she convinced Chad to discard his wife. You know, I'm pretty sure that that's how some of that went down. Uh, Elizabeth Salvatore. Thank you for that. All the dark spirits were people who could get them money by their deaths. Chad's children weren't dark spirits, but he had no money to gain by killing them. And Megan, I just want to get your take on this. Ned Smith adding, why were Chad's children spared and Lori's murdered? Was it I simply a money issue, Megan? Yeah, I think it was purely financial because if they just wanted to get rid of the children, if they wanted to be a couple together, they know that they could have given JJ to to um, his grandparents and they would have very happily taken care of him and probably Tylee, too. And they had multiple family members that would have taken care of those kids if they just if Lori just didn't want to be a mom anymore. So I think it was 100 percent financially motivated. Um you know, just just like it was for for Charles as well. Uh, Joyce Kirby in the chat saying my son is an autistic adult, very high functioning, and I can't see it with Chad. So uh, that that argument is continuing. Rosemary Romero to Gigi. Uh, what does Gigi know about Chad calling the funeral home about Charles cremation and how much it would cost? Uh, interesting question. I uh, hate to put you on the spot, G-Money, but what do you know about this, if anything? I know Chad's not very good at making up fake names to <laughs> act like a Chad Dayball. <laughs> I mean, it's like, really, dude? Could you not be more obvious? Yeah, so he called the day that Charles was shot and killed, saying that his uncle Myron had died and was going to the medical examiner, and they weren't super close, but he didn't have a lot of family, so he was trying to get an estimate on cremation and shipping the remains to new Orleans, which isn't super far from, from where Kay and Larry live. So yeah, he did call it's out there. I think I actually have it on my YouTube channel with subtitles, but it's very creepy and cringy. And at one point he says something like, we'll deal with the services later. And he giggles. You can kind of hear him giggle off the phone a bit. And it's just, it's so bizarre. But what's not in this case, you know, it's, I mean, it, it's just one more layer of this, I can't believe people actually followed this guy. Mm. Blows my mind. Somebody yeah. told me they were the brother of Jesus. I'd say, we need to take a trip to the doctor. Not yeah. like, can I come with you? I mean, this, people are so gullible. This is what I, I just, this is the part I don't get. Um, you know, you see all these cults that we've had over time, but the cult leaders are generally charismatic people. Um, and we've had cult experts on the show, but I just cannot see chad convincing anyone to do anything um will that call be used as evidence g money what do you think i could but you know he's not charged with anything in charles's death and i know um in Lori's trial there was very little they allowed to come in about charles and with chad not charged in that i'm not sure how much will come in it could show just you know i mean we got an attorney here but it could just show the mindset and and the things he was willing to do to further this mission um, you know, by the way, I think the, the same credit card Lori used to pay for his cremation, she ended up and paid for Chad to come down to Arizona with this, you know, not long after it's insane. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a crazy call for sure. <laughs> Chad uh, Dayball. Day <laughs> <laughs> Chris, 
Greg Stewart is uh, from Katrina here. And you talked about this early on. Do your guest, the only lawyer, does he have a take? Does Greg Scordis have a take on this judge, Stephen Boyce? Is he too lenient in allowing so many objections? I mean, there were a ton today, and this is day one out of the gates. Um, this is going to be I, – I never understand the um, the game plan here. I don't know if he's trying to interrupt the, the flow of the narrative, but, Greg, we're going to be in for a long trial if there are this many objections. What did you make of it and the judge? Yeah, I thought he could have wrapped them up a lot better, Joel. I, I really feel like um, he's trying to um, trying to appease a counsel, defense counsel, and so he throws him a bone once in a while and just sustains an objection. And I'm like, that was no different than the one you just overruled last time. So, um, and, and then you know, the, the, another problem is you probably heard the judge say we're not having court on Friday. We didn't have court on Tuesday. Uh, last Friday was a waste of time. I mean, this judge and I say this with all due respect, made Lori's four-week trial into a six-week trial, and he's about to make Chad's, what I consider to be a five- or six-week trial, into a 12-week trial. There's just no motivation to move this case along. I mean, I have judges who are like, hey, we're not, we're, we're working tomorrow. We're, we're going to start this. And, you know, we had the jury selected by all intent and purpose on Thursday, and then maybe we'll come back Friday and maybe do peremptories. And then he's just, Every time there's an objection, we have to have a sidebar and talk about it. You're right. I mean, it, to me, as an attorney, very frustrating. And uh, I, I don't have to practice in, in this jurisdiction, luckily, uh, because I'd probably be held in contempt of court. But it, it's, 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 it's painful to watch the way he um, controls or better said doesn't control his courtroom. And I, I say that with all respect. He's got the robes on. I'll never wear robes. But – so he's doing something I'm not. Well, I don't know about that, Greg, but um, interesting point. Do we know why there is no court on Friday? No, I mean, he. why didn't we have court yesterday? I mean, it's great. I'm in Boise, and I'll tell you, Joel, it is beautiful golf weather. And that's the, the only thing I can think of why we're not having court on Friday. He said that the attorneys had to deal with some issues. We've had four years to deal with issues or you know what I mean? We've had, the, we've had at least a year since Lori's uh, trial to deal with all these issues. And, and so I don't understand why we're not moving this case along. I know that he's going to say he set aside two weeks for jury selection and we're all way ahead of that, but nobody who's ever practiced on a capital case really thought jury selection was going to go two weeks, four days, five days, maybe, and we had the jury in four days, but he's sort of using those two weeks anyway. And uh, that's we're, we're just going to drag this trial out. I feel very bad for the jurors because yeah, those was, are people yeah. they're making ten dollars a day, Joel, ten dollars a day. I was I was just going to say that out of everybody, I feel the worst for these jurors. They're going to have to sit there for weeks on end. Uh, Donna McDon uh, Donna Donald, a uh, Marshall Applewhite was not a looker either. That he is the famous leader. You remember the guy with the uh, white short hair and a short guy heaven's gate um but he he had some uh, i think at least some uh, charisma to get these people to follow him and this is a good point because we're talking about chad daybell being persuasive joel he had six he needed one hundred and forty four thousand. uh that is a good point so uh getting back to rob wood here and then we'll get to the defense uh he talked about the collapse of the dream he also had a powerpoint presentation uh, he lists the attempted murder of Brandon Boudreaux, which is going on in Arizona. That's Lori's next trial. Uh, concern for the missing children, lies to police, unwillingness to produce the children, the raccoon text, all part of this uh, collapse of a dream. And then went on to talk about how the trial, as Greg was just saying, is going to be very long with many witnesses. And talked, Rob Wood did, about evidence to come, including financial, law enforcement testimony, even some Hawaii po police are going to be uh, subpoenaed for this. Megan, uh, to you, we talked about it briefly, but what are you expecting differently here in this trial, either evidence-wise or otherwise? We already heard some evidence today that was different than what came out in Lori's trial. Um, the detective was able to testify about the time that he uh, spoke with Chad and Alex when he was asking for 
Lori's um, location and, and JJ's location. It was just more detailed, I think, this time than we heard in Lori's trial. And so I think that's kind of how it's going to go. We're going to hear a lot of the same evidence, but I think we're going to get an angle in, you know, Chad and Alex's involvement that we didn't get in Lori's trial. And that's what I'm hoping for, in fact. It's going to be a this is going to be a long, uh, drawn out trial. There is no doubt about that. Um, Rob Wood wrapped up his uh, opening statements and then we'll switch over to the defense, basically saying, listen, you're going to hear the defendant's own words, uh, G money. So maybe that's where we he's indicating we might hear some of these calls. And he says that your verdict is going to be the final chapter. Uh, was that an effective way to close opening statements, which some people thought were a little lackluster? I mean, I, I think it. I think the openings went fine. I, I've seen people who thought they weren't great, but it's really not about the openings. It's about what they do after the openings up until closings that's going to make the biggest impact. And like I said, there's so many moving parts in this case that I think that doing it by chapters with him being an author was a little bit of a, you know, slap in the face to Chad, who so who, what he made two thousand bucks a year selling his books. So. um yeah, I thought they were good, and I thought it ended well. And, I mean, look, I mean, the, already you have Detective Hermosillo on the stand who is on day one giving some very powerful testimony that sets up you've got these adults who seemingly don't care. There are two kids that the police are trying to find, and they're lying. Oh, I hardly know her. That's your wife, dude. You know? And so I think that openings, it's just not, like, the main focus. Of course, it's an introduction, but... What what the what I saw last year sitting in that trial every day except for the one day I went to Atlanta with my daughter for Taylor Swift, um, it's very effective. And the jurors' faces at times horrified, shocked. Uh, John Pryor would look at them when certain texts were read out loud that are very cringy. And um, so I don't think the openings, whether you think they were good or bad, at the end of the day, it's going to be what comes in the middle before those closings that's going to decide this case. And um, you know, getting up there almost like a, a preacher and slinging your arms around and yelling it's i don't know in this kind of case i think the subtle very unassuming was the way to go uh, i think you might be right and um you're 100 percent right about the fact that it's gonna be the facts and the evidence and honestly uh, if this goes as long as they say i don't think any of these jurors are even going to remember uh these opening statements and the closings are going to be uh super powerful and important uh patty david who's in the chat uh very often Megan, so much love to you, and thank you for sharing with STS. Tough times ahead for you, so please do this self-love and care for yourself, followed by this question from Rosemary again. Is Megan uh, going to listen and watch, you're not going to be able to see it unless you're in the courtroom, the graphic description of the autopsies and the crime scenes? That's got to be incredibly difficult for you, Megan. How are you going to handle that? You know, that's a good question, and I don't have a good answer yet. Um, I... I have planned to to listen to and watch everything. Um, I don't know how I'm going to feel up to that point. I do have to kind of just take it one day at a time and and do what I can. Um, I'm I feel an obligation to witness this trial for the children, and and I can't really explain why I feel that way, but I do. Um, I have already processed through the deaths of the children. And I've done a lot of work mental health wise to um, be able to just be out here walking around like a normal human being. So um, I, I do have a lot of good tools for dealing with traumatic things. That being said, I don't want to subject myself to trauma that I don't need to, you know, so I really do just have to take it one trial day at a time and see how I'm feeling. Um, I would like to be able to listen to everything. Um, listening to it the first time was pretty difficult, but again, I just feel, I feel like I just need to wit witness it on behalf of the children to, to be there for them. Um, I totally get it. Sometimes you have to witness horrible parts of history to kind of understand it and uh, get where you're coming from there. So um, I hope you have strength doing that. Um, Thank you. That was a good question from Rosemary. Um, Greg, I'm just curious. Uh, John Pryor has, he's kind of has an acerbic personality. He literally has a prior on his record. So people were kind of poking fun at him for that. 
uh, today. I'm curious what, just looking at him in the courtroom, what did you make of his personality before he even delivered those opening remarks? He kind of has a little bit of a harsh um, person about him. He, uh, he was not uh, warm and fuzzy with his client at all, which I think is something the jury is watching and they're, they're directly across from the jury. And, um, you know, and he kind of, you know, those objections, he, they weren't good and he, he wasn't winning them. And I just think that after a couple of days, the jury is going to go, dude, like, let's, can we just hear the evidence? It's going to come in anyway. I mean, the question about hearsay, what did the guy from the other counties tell you? Well, that's hearsay. Well, it probably is. So they're just going to put the guy from the other county on the stand. I mean, what a waste of time. And then these photographs, he just, every single one, he would like, can I vor die? Well, were you present when the photograph was taken? Uh, who else was present? That, none of those are relevant. The question, when you look at a photograph is, is this what you saw? And if the answer is, yeah, that's what I saw, it doesn't matter who took the photograph or when it was taken or how it was taken or what color the camera was. And he just goes through all this stuff. And I'm like, why are you doing that? I mean, we know you're smart. We know you're a great lawyer. But that that's not going to work with a two-month trial. No, I mean, we're objecting to a photo of J.J. Vallow coming in. It's like, right. oh, this is going to be a kid. long trial. Right. Objection. Gosh. Who took that photo? Who cares? Who cares who took the photo? You know, I could look at a photo of you, Joel, and say, that's, that's Joel. Well, who took the photo? I don't know. You just recognize the guy. He's a good-looking guy. That's him. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's, all that, that's all that matters when you're identifying a photograph in court. Is it a representation of what you saw? Is it a fair and accurate representation of what you saw? That's the threshold question. None of and, that else matters. And this is why Greg's doing the commentary as a lawyer. It's interesting because he knows all the innuendos, all the ins and outs, and uh, he's seeing that. Uh, so that is interesting to me. Brenda Redmond, so mad uh, that John Pryor insinuated that Tammy died of natural causes. Gigi, uh, your thoughts on this? He even said he's going to call the children to talk about how she was ill, et cetera, et cetera. This is, uh, we haven't even gotten to the part about the pasture yet, but this part of uh, the opening statements, do you agree with Brenda on this? Yeah, I think the only way he's able to do this is because ultimately that autopsy was negative. So it was just sort of, she passed away. They didn't see any visible, I mean, there's bruises on her. We saw those last year in Lori's trial, very consistent with somebody holding the arms. But when an autopsy is negative and you can't say how exactly it happened or, or how she died or what caused it, um, that's the only way he has to go in there and put reasonable doubt in those jurors' minds to maybe get Chad off that one charge or get him, you know, maybe they can agree on it. It's, look, I mean, she was with her family right before she died. Everybody who knew her said she was fine the day before. She was chipper, dancing in the living room, taking clogging classes, taking Zumba classes. I want to see the state call her clogging teacher in there. Was she ever winded? Did she ever say I'm lightheaded? You know, I think that might be more powerful, but here's the thing. We don't need the medical examiner. We've got text messages from Chad saying her name is Viola. She's been taken over. She's a level three demonic entity. And I don't know about the timing for removal and things like that. So it's almost like you don't, you know how they say you don't need a body to find somebody guilty. These texts are more powerful than any medical examiner report out there. So we were worried last year that Lori might not get convicted on that conspiracy to commit murder charge for Tammy, but it all fits in the big narrative. Once these jurors get this whole picture and hear that Chad and Lori are texting less than 24 hours after Tammy was found dead, I want to be in your arms. I want to be with you. I love you. I'm sad, but not for the reason people think. You don't need that medical examiner to testify that we can't say how she died. It's pretty clear what happened. It sure is. Sure the hell is. Um, I'm here. I wish we could get uh, um, Alex Cox exhumed, but that's not happening either to see what happened there. But Greg scored us back to you because this is uh, an attorney question. So uh, Pryor came out and he said, look, I'm from Meridian, Idaho, basically telling him I'm just like you, a local um, and the only thing that matters here is facts and evidence. And then he goes on to talk a little bit about Chad's mission uh, in New Jersey. Who knew that Chad and I were in the same state at the same time? That was back in 1990. Uh, and then he dated this woman, Tammy Daybell, for six months, uh, which was long. Um, 
By the way, the other thing that was interesting, it sounds like John Pryor never heard about a Mormon before this. He said he didn't know what these missions were, didn't know. Did you find that strange? Yeah, I mean, why play that card? I mean, certainly you're in a very LDS community. Uh, if you've got 18 jurors, you can bet in Boise, Idaho, that nine of them are LDS. And so he comes out with, oh, he went on this thing they call a mission, and he dated her for six months, which is a really long time for that religion. He mentioned the word mission. I wrote it down three times. <laughs> like, don't don't go there. I mean, and then sort of acting like oh, this this religion. I don't know much about it, but hey, I guess they uh, they don't date very long, and they go on missions. Like, I, I, there was only one reason to do that, Joel, and it was the wrong reason. And it was to appeal to the jurors who happen to be Latter day Saints, hope that. Well, buy into that sort of argument. Yeah. Um, Megan, I'm curious what you made of that. Um, you know, it's sort of a minor but major point because he's obviously representing uh, a client who is LDS. Uh, there's a big part of this case. I know that you were once a part of that church, no longer, but for the, his defense attorney to come out and play this sort of dumb guy where he had no idea what this religion is, what it's about, what these missions are. It, it was just odd to me, if anything. Am I allowed to curse on this channel? Yes, you sure can. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Exactly>. You know, <laughs> I, I, I think that, it, you know, if you're an attorney who's representing a client who's a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and you haven't done any homework on that religion, and you have no idea how it affects your client, I mean, for LDS people, their religion is their entire life. It's their entire worldview and could possibly be used as part of the defense. So why would you not know everything there is to know about your client? I, in the office that I work in, we have a saying for, for that kind of stuff, and it's called shitty lawyering. <laughs> That's a good phrase to know, especially for my show. Something Greg Scordis never does. Uh, Greg, from Bama Girl 75 I heard the judge tell the jury they couldn't talk to each other, period as in no small talk, not just no talking about the case. Is that abnormal? Did we hear that, Greg? I, I, I could barely hear, so I don't think I heard that part. We did not hear that. In fact, Joel, we heard the opposite. What he said was, you can talk, but don't talk about the case. Don't talk about the facts of the case. I mean, obviously the jurors are going to talk. They're going to talk about the weather. There's so many tie that doesn't match or something like that. But they, he just instructed them, and he'll continue to at every break, and at every close of court for the day, not to talk about the facts of the case. So I heard it differently. I may be wrong, but I heard him give an instruction that is consistent with virtually every judge I've heard in the middle of a jury trial about talking about the case, bad, talking to each other about other things, okay. Uh, Megan from Carrie here, she, she wants to know if it's common in LDS, uh, in the church, to have a cremation. Um, it's not really common at all. Um, in fact, I, I don't think that I've ever heard of um, any other Mormons that I know of being cremated other than um, in the Cox family. Um, and I, will, I do want to clarify, there was an autopsy done on Alex. It was found to be, quote unquote, natural causes, pulmonary embolism. Um, and they did save some blood and tissue samples for further testing if something comes up in the future. So if we do, if we are able to find out um, what, you know, what finally killed Tammy or if she had other toxins or anything like that, you know, they can go back and retest some of Alex's samples for those things. Um, but I think, unfortunately, it's it's going to remain a mystery. And But, you know, bottom line is, Nobody will ever be able to convince me that he died of natural causes. The day after Tammy's body was exhumed, no way. Yep, uh, I have a lot of trouble believing that as well. But uh, sadly, I, I don't think we're ever going to know the true answer to that. Um, G Money, um, John Pryor goes on and he says uh, that Chad was a writer, that he wrote about a lot of things uh, like premonitions. You even wrote about death. And then he goes on to say, and this is a direct quote, he meets this beautifully stunning woman she pursues him uh 
and then starts. This is where the process where he starts to basically derail her, throw her under the bus and, and talks about these horrific marriages she was in. She was in a marriage right out of high school. It didn't last. She was in a second marriage. It didn't last. What did you make of this part? We were expecting, um, you know, this character assassination to go hard against Lori. Um, was this exactly what you expected or slightly different? I mean, it's kind of predictable. He would go after she's the blonde bombshell and he's kind of the dopey dude that wears his khakis too high and tucks in his little plaid shirts and has a bad buzz cut. So, of course, it's going to tickle his fancy. But, you know, I, I, I'm curious to see when he puts on his case, uh, what is he going to do to further that? It's it's kind of easy to say that he was just led astray by lust. But I don't know. I mean, I'd, geez, Louise, I don't know. I, mean, I don't dream about this guy tonight. I've been so deep in this with the deep diving stuff. But my goodness, I, I don't even know, Joel. It's just like there are a lot of other things you could say, I mean, about her and what was done during the course of this year, you know, from beginning to end. And just to say she was this beautiful siren that came to the Mormon book table and was going to sell all of his books. That was a little weak, actually, if you're going to throw under the bus. Yeah. Uh, gee, you got to listen to some Pink Floyd tonight and put on some mood. Light. Keep your studio lights on and just chill out. So I don't want you to have a dream about Chad or John I dreamed Dwyer. about him last night, Joel. I woke up. I was like, <laughs> yeah. really? The eight hours that I'm not working? There he is front and center. Ooh. I dreamed one time he was my dad. And I was just like, I want my real daddy. Oh, it was boy. terrifying. There was no storm in that dream, was there? Oh, my God. Don't get, listen, can I just say the day that happened in court, Joel, I'm live tweeting for Long Crime Network, and I have the sense of humor of a 12-year-old boy. Yeah. So, you know, the dude's Good on the lie. stand, and I know what's coming. He's like, because I put two and two together. He's like, can you tell us what the storm is? And I was like, don't smile. Don't smile. You're going to get kicked out. Don't. So he says, you know, it was his penis. And I'm like... So here I am, like, tweeting out all the storm gifts I can find, and I'm tweeting out Riders on the Storm by the doors, and I'm tweeting out every, like, the thunder rolls. I tweeted that out today. See where my mind goes? But, um, gosh, the storm. I was having mm. to sit on my hands and bite my tongue, Joel. I was like, the judge is going to see me laughing and kick me out. Mm. Oh, dear. The storm? Uh, it sounds uh, like a WWE wrestler. Yeah, this is, uh, that part is, I can't even... I can't even go there. I'll have a dream. I bet you have a dream tonight now. Uh, Baker Canner says, <laughs> oh, no. what is most upsetting to me is how each of the victims were confronted in their last moments by the people who were supposed to care for them, but who they knew were getting ready uh, to murder them. That is, um, when you think about that, really think about it for a moment, that is um, frightening and, and really disturbing. This part of the opening statements irritated the crap out of me. I don't know if I can say that, but uh, John Pryor says, look, Alex Cox, shoots joe ryan with a taser and this sort of develops uh it, it's the start of a pattern this goes back to 2007 he admits john Pryor does that chad and Lori had this inappropriate relationship uh but then goes on and basically in the same phrase megan i'm going to come to you on this he talks about this sexual person that comes into chad's life and literally just he describes her as a very sexual person but then intimates in the same line uh, or a couple lines later, that Chad's backyard is a four and a half acre farm. So it's really not a backyard. It's a pasture, implying that Chad wouldn't even know what was going on in his property and really pointing the finger at this point at Alex. I'm curious what you made of this part of the opening statements, because it was it was going pretty low, pretty dirty. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about Lori, um, my my good friend Lauren from Hidden True Crime called it slut shaming. I guess we're going to just do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we tried to establish a pattern of her having erratic relationships and her being very sexual and, and all of that stuff. So, again, that was it. It just made me angry for that to be the, you know, the, the major focus of that. Again, as Gigi said, if you're going to throw Lori under the bus, there is a lot there that you could have worked with that probably would have been more effective for your client. And as far as the, uh, the acreage on the property, I think he's really just trying to sell the, um, you know, the resale value there so he can make some money. Uh, you might be right about that. And little does he know right now that uh, he has a buyer in you. Um, 
So that's kind of crazy. Uh, Greg Scordis, uh, just a couple more things, and then I promise we will wrap. Um, Pryor did say he's bringing on this DNA expert, a guy named Dr. Greg Hampikian. Uh, he is the person that got Amanda Knox exonerated in Italy, and he was talking specifically about that hair, or several hairs, I should say, that were found on the plastic, uh, which was wrapped around J.J. Vallow without getting too graphic. Um, how effective could this guy be? Um, why would he bring it up if he didn't think he's going to bring some value to the table here for the defense? Well, I think that that is just a small piece of the puzzle for the state, Joel. And I don't know that that excluding that or discrediting that is going to make a difference. I mean, this is a this is a circumstantial case. This is a case that has a lot going on with it in terms of statements made, recorded phone calls, uh, just Chad's reaction to what was going on today when Hermosillo was testifying. You know, he tries to run away. I mean, there's a lot going on here. That oh boy. Mid -sentence. Pulled out. Those demons were taking <laughs> over the Wi-Fi right there. That was a quick and sudden uh, departure. But uh, this data expert, they're also going to, let's see, I think Greg might be, Greg, you back? They, uh, the demons whipped you off that screen. Are you back? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, can, go, go right ahead. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just was trying to make a point that the, 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 this, the state's not hanging its hat on a DNA sample. Bring the expert in, have him discredit it. The jury will say, okay, great. What, what, what were the other 999 things we heard about, Chad? Uh, McSpunky said that uh, Greg's portal just opened up and uh, enter Zulema. There is some humor here. Swallowed uh, Greg right up. A couple quick things. Uh, G Money also, uh, they're going to bring on uh, a data expert to show that Alex Cox was really the one at Chad's property. Um, and that Chad, as we started off by saying, his three to four children are going to testify for the defense. Are either of these sets of witnesses, do you think, going to be effective? Uh, the children, I would imagine, more so than the data expert, but maybe not. Maybe it's the science that will deliver more results. What do you think? I mean, then you have to explain the text message that he sent to Tammy, what, 17 minutes after Alex had left the property, saying that he had shot the raccoon and he was going to burn limb this, this limb debris I mean, for everything that I think Pryor's going to do, there's 50 things waiting in line to just make Pryor look like um, he's got nothing. You know, so I, I just, I think the kids, you know, that might be his strongest um, chance at convincing the jury of much. But I, I really still don't think so because when they see the photos of the bruises on Tammy, it makes sense. I mean, it's, you know, it, it looks like in the position that she was held down. It's it's just so sad. I just don't think that, you know, you got to throw a lot of things against the wall and see what sticks when your client's up for death. And even though it is largely circumstantial, which we did have the DNA in the barn of Tylee's, and we don't know yet, I still believe a lot of that's going to come in Chad's trial where it didn't with Lori because it's not pleasant to think about, but things had to happen to Tylee's body um, for her to be found in the condition she was in. And we know it didn't happen in the townhomes because there was no biological evidence there. I think that barn's going to come in in a big way. And when you've got DNA on your pickaxe and shovel that's leaned against your wall uh, to say that Alex was able to dig a grave in 17 minutes when the morning he was there for JJ, when you have cut roots from a tree, it's an uphill battle, if not like an uphill icy, you know, battle. I just, I don't think any of the, nothing's going to combat what the state's bringing to the table, which are just horrific facts that they can back up. It's uh, it's going to be a huge uphill battle for the defense. Greg, I uh, just want to ask you this. What, I mean, John Pryor is defending this client solo for what could be eight to 10 weeks. Pretty much any attorney I've spoken to said that it's the craziest thing they've ever heard. You heard Gigi say, what if he gets COVID? What if any, what if he sprains his ankle and he can't walk? Um, have you ever heard of this high profile a case with one criminal defense attorney? I've never heard of a low profile capital case with one defense attorney. I mean, you just don't do it. This is a capital case. It will be appealed for the next 20 years. And they will look at everything that attorney did, everything he didn't do. And um, ultimately, he's going to be in the crosshairs uh, of the appeal of Chad's appeal. Chad will attack him like he did everybody else in his life. But, yeah, I mean, I, I'm surprised the court just didn't appoint a, 
at public defender as a second chair or something when Pryor was, was complaining about the lack of funds. The court may have created an error too here, but when, when Pryor's begging for to get off the case, he's really begging for money. And I think that the judge would have done everybody a favor by appointing standby counsel. I mean, I get put in those roles all the time and just say, look, you're on the hook, public defender, and you're going to try this case with John Pryor. Get up to speed. Let's rock and roll. And that's, you know, I hate to say there's a built-in appeal here, but just having one, one lawyer on a capital case, I mean, the prosecution's got four. Um, and I, I just, that, that's going to be, that's going to make it much more difficult uh, in terms of looking backwards at the case in the appeal. And Greg, Tim Jansen this morning was saying when you're a criminal defense attorney on a trial like this, you've got to prepare for court, then you're in court, then you go home, you got to prepare the next day, you're working like 16, 18, 20 hour days. How is he going to have, now that we're just talking about the storm, pardon this word, but how is he going to have the stamina to make it through this, uh, this trial? He's not. I mean, he's just not. You, you Even if you just divide witnesses, I'll take A, B, and C, you take D, E, and F. Uh, let I'll do opening, you do closing. Uh, I'll do the, the jury instructions, you do uh, the, 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 the expert witnesses. I mean, you have to do that. This is a, this is a capital case that's going to go for 10 weeks, um, and there are, I don't know, dozens of witnesses. How do you prepare a cross-examination for every one? I mean, I know he's had a couple of years to do that, but he's also been doing his other stuff and doing his job and trying to make money and try to trying to survive. I mean, I don't I don't know how you try a death penalty case by yourself. I, I think it's almost ineffective assistance of counsel per se. Wow. So that's I, my I'll, question. Is it is it strategy on Chad's part uh, or on the attorney's part to only have one person? So they, like you said, have a built in appeal or have a built in, you know, this is, you know, couldn't one person couldn't do the job. There's no way that he could have done a good job. It, it, do you think that was strategy? And, and by the way, not to mention, from what I understand, Pryor has never handled a murder case, Greg. But to Megan's question, is this being done on purpose? No, I mean, you, they're still going to have to go through the record and see things that he could have or should have done. I, I can't imagine, I can't even imagine a judge would let that happen. On a case like this, Joel, uh, people will be looking at him in the future going, what were you thinking? So, it wasn't done on purpose. I think people gave Pryor a credit for the skills that he has, and he obviously has some skills, and hoping that he'll at least cross that minimal threshold that you have to do to, to be an effective attorney. Uh, Scordis has way more skills. Last question, and then we'll get a final wrap-up here from Kelly P. And it's two questions for Gigi. Will Chad testify? And where uh, will the jury be allowed to be while being sequestered? Do we know the answers to this? I don't think Chad will testify. Heck no. Um, he's going to have a lot to answer to with a lot of really incriminating evidence against him. So no. Um, at what, you know, okay. So what is this? They're not sequestered right now, right? No, they're going to be sequestered from what I understand during deliberations. Deliberations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, usually they have what cops posted outside just to make sure nobody's in there talking about the cases. I don't think they can watch TV. Um, I don't know how it goes with being sequestered, but um, that might make for a really quick deliberation. <laughs> mm. um, I got to say, this was a, a, despite the subject matter, a fun show. I thought I was going to have to talk for 90 minutes solo. I'd still be going. I don't know what I'd be saying. I'd be telling more Fred stories. Uh, Linda K. Detweiler, um, Greg Scordis, for those who do not know, is a hell of a criminal defense attorney former prosecutor out of the Salt Lake, Utah area, and he's uh, covering this for a local station in Salt Lake City, and that's why he's there. Greg, are you going home for the weekend? That's question number one. I'm going home tonight. <laughs> I'm, going home. I'm going home, and uh, you can see I'm in my car. I yeah. stopped for Joel. That's thank the you. only reason I stopped my car. Greg, thank you so much for so, that. Uh, does Pryor know all the evidence, or can there be a smoking gun that he does not know about Greg and your final thoughts. Absolutely not. The state has to disclose everything it has. And, and they, in, in America, uh, is it, there's the constitution provides that the defense has a right to confront and cross examine the witnesses, which means, you know, who they are, you have prior notice and the state has an absolute obligation to disclose everything. There can be no surprises here. There you go. You heard from Greg Scordis. 
Gigi McKelvey coming in last minute because our show kind of fell apart. We love the rock star. Um, there's a reason we call her G Money because she is money. She's also the host of Pretty Lies and Alibis. If you're not listening, you're not subscribing on YouTube, what are you doing? You're, you're more like Chad Daybell than a normal person. Get with the program and subscribe to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Gigi, your final thoughts. This is going to be a long haul here. We're going to have you uh, on our show a lot in the coming weeks. Yeah, uh, the final thoughts is just the focus needs to be on the victims and um, why we're here. And I, just I think everybody's ready to see justice. It's been so long in the making. And at the end of the day, what was done to Tylee and JJ and Tammy is just almost too horrific to think about. So I'm just glad his time is here. And um, hopefully it, it, you know, ends in the same result, but he's innocent until proven guilty. But yeah, um, I, my heart's just been with with the families today and and just thinking about we just touched on that earlier, what 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 these three humans went through in their final moments. And it's just, you know, it haunts you to think about. But um, yeah, so just let's do it for the victims and honor them every step of the way. I think that's the biggest thing is not to get so over invested in, in the storm and the text. And yeah, it's fun. But at the end of the day, these three people right here on our screen were ripped out of this world for nothing at all and in a very violent way. So that's where my heart is. And that's where the focus has got to be every day when we're watching this and covering this and everything else or those three humans. And then later it'll be Charles, you know, in, in Arizona. I was going to say, these aren't the only three, which is so sad, but uh, there you've got JJ, Tylee and Tammy. And that's what this trial is about getting justice for them. Megan Connor, of course, uh, Lori Vallow's cousin, but she is so much more uh, than that. She is uh, a woman who has overcome trauma, um, Walk Through Fire to Get Here is her book, Walk Through Fire to Get Here. And Megan, tell everyone what the podcast is and where they can find it. Yeah, so my podcast just launched on Monday. It was the uh, single Brad. most stunning cosmic event in the history of the world. Um other than the eclipse, I guess. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, it's called The Midlife Revolution. It is all about um, making small changes that create a revolutions in, in people's life. It's about healing and it's about, um, you know, discovering what happens when you step off the treadmill and decide to choose a life for yourself. So it has nothing to do with Lori or Chad. Um, it is all about uh, my healing journey and helping other people to heal from trauma as well. It's available on. In fact, if people would go to my YouTube channel and subscribe there, the podcast is going to start being posted there um, this coming Monday. So my YouTube channel is at third underscore verse. Mm. Gigi, reading this comments, uh, you could have been Chad Daybell. Everyone is worshiping you and uh, saying that they <laughs> follow you. I bet you could have gotten a lot more than the six out of 144. Uh, by the way, uh, final question. I lied. Greg, did you see Larry and Kay Woodcock today? Some people thought that Kay was going to be called as a first witness. Um, did you see them? How are they doing? How are they feeling? Oh, they were working the crowd, especially Larry. It, it, while, while Chad was sitting there looking lost in the courtroom, Larry was working the crowd. Uh, he and Kay were sitting there. They seemed to have some sort of special chairs. The judge did allow that victims, uh, because there's what's called the exclusionary rule, which means witnesses can't sit in the trial. There's an exception for victims, families. And so, yeah, Kay and Larry will be allowed to sit in the courtroom, even if they end up testifying. And, and they were there for the entire time. Uh, by the way, I need a midlife revolution because I'm having a midlife crisis. So uh, I have to talk to Megan. I think I need a vacation, COE. And that's not happening for a long time. But uh want to thank these guests. They stepped up. I really appreciate it. Until tomorrow. By the way, Sebastian Robbins, speaking of autism, a 15-year-old with autism on the uh, spectrum. And uh, we are following his case. Where is he? He's been missing for, uh, this is the sixth week. And uh, you're going on a book tour. That is, a, yeah, that's some vacation. I'm, that's, I can't, yeah, it'll be fun, but a different sort of fun. That will not be a relaxing vacation. Um Love here. Oh, by the way, yeah. Second channel as I wrap up. The longest goodbye in history. I picked this up from Carm. She can never say goodbye. Second channel at Surviving the Survivor Trials, the best trials in true crime. We're going to be having uh, the Chad Daybell trial only on that channel with closed captioning.
gavel to gavel tomorrow. Sebastian Rogers at 5 p.m. Until then, love you, America. Love you, panel. Love you, Utah. Love you, South Carolina. Love you, Texas and Arizona. And, of course, let us think about these. And a huge shout-out to all the mods. That goes without saying. Space Coast on the West Coast and the COE. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Thank you. And, Greg, thank you for sticking around before taking off to the airport. Thank <laughs> you.